So, flexible milking. Um, where to start? I suppose I'll start with an introduction. Um, so, my name is Paul Edwards. I'm a senior scientist in our farm systems research team. And like I mentioned before, we've got Callum Eastwood on the call as well uh, from his home. Um, and he's going to just help you know, with, uh, direct some of those questions. He's a uh, senior scientist as well in the um, farm systems team. And yeah. So, flexible milking. Um, this is a presentation that I gave at, um, largely based on a presentation I gave at Farmers Forum a couple of weeks ago uh, in Canterbury. Um, and there was uh, lots of questions there and, and some good feedback. So we decided to um, run this webinar as an opportunity to, for a wider audience to, um, to check out what we've been up to. So why flexible milking? Well, um, I guess I've sort of framed this uh, presentation up with the question, can we adapt milking intervals to improve workplace attractiveness? Um, and that's sort of coming at it from two angles, one from hours and one from flexibility. The hour side of things I think is um, reasonably straightforward to, to understand. We know milking accounts for around half of um, annual labour requirements on dairy farm and uh, so any changes in um, milking intervals to try and uh, reduce that milking time is obviously going to free up some hours potentially. Uh, but then that flexibility aspect I think is, a, is equally if not more important. Um, we think about milking sort of traditionally anyway, twice a day milking being you know, a very fixed time point in the morning and then in the afternoon that really dictates how a lot of the day um, day works. And also the, the that, that, um, that 4 a.m. start aspect to it, which uh, when we're trying to attract people from other industries or be competitive with other industries offering conventional work hours can be um, one barrier that, that we have in the industry. So adapting our milking intervals to try and improve that, um, that flexibility, I think is a, there's a big opportunity there. So I'll start with um, some of the background to, to how the project came about and um, or, or the background to this question. So I'll start with full season once a day milking. Because uh, obviously that's the the ultimate when it comes to flexibility, because you could you can time your milking at any time during the day, and there's only one of them. Um, but the question people then always ask around once a day is what's the, the impact of production likely to be, which is a very good question. And so um, I've put up this chart here now um, that came from analysis I did a couple of years ago, pulling data out of the um, or analysing herds, there's about 300 herds here that have adopted full season once a day milking and following my mouse, um, we've got their years before they went once a day, year zero is the first year of once a day and then this is the years after once a day. And what I've done is I've grouped them um, into different production categories. Um, the reason I did this was because on average there was an 11% decrease um, uh, when, when a herd went once a day but averages can hide many things. So I, we went and um, segmented the herds, grouped them up by if before going once a day, they were doing less than uh, 250 milk sods per cow, and then up so forth in 50, uh, 50 kilos of milk solid increments. And so what we can see there is the black line, um, those doing less than 250 milk sods, their production actually increased after they went to full season once a day milking, which um, physiologically doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense, but um, implies to me that there was some sort of management limitation that was overcome by going once a day. And if we move up uh, to the blue line, 250 to 300, well, there was a, a slight decrease in that first year, um, but then reasonably quickly got back uh, to, to where they were prior to going once a day. And it, but as we move further up, that drop, uh, gets greater and doesn't necessarily get back up to, the, the production doesn't necessarily get back up to where it was. So if we actually group those two, uh, the blue line and the black line together, there's actually, uh, if you look at the, the annual dairy statistics, there's around 20 to 25% of um, the national herd sits in that group. And actually what that's say, saying to me is that there's, for those guys, um, it's there's relatively small opportunity cost to be going full season once a day milking. For the next group, that yellow group, there's probably a, a sort of a grey area um, where 
you know, there is a bit more of a production drop, but equally in some cases it may be possible to offset that, um, that production loss, depending on how the, the business is structured or the, the physical kind of setup of the farm. So it could suit another 20%. Um, whereas there's those higher producing categories up here and the orange line, and then, you know, there's, there's also obviously herds that are higher than that. Uh, for them, once day milking is probably going to be more difficult to justify. Um, and I think when I click onto the next um, slide in a, in a minute, um, we'll see that this graph sort of helps explain um, some of the regional variation in the use of different milking intervals. Which leads us nicely into our first poll question, um, which is what is the percentage of, what do you think uh, the percentage of dairy farmers that milk full season twice a day is? Callum is just going to, yep, he's opened up the poll now, so everyone should have the opportunity to vote. Just give a few minutes to let those come in. So we've got options of 46%, 50%, 62%, and 84%. Around two thirds of you have voted now. Eighty-five percent have voted. Ninety percent. Probably close enough, Callum. You can probably close that off now. And so the results. So around half of you said uh, sixty-two percent milk full season twice a day. Around 20% then uh, being split between the 84% and the 64% and 9% sitting at the 50%. So let's have a look at um, some numbers now. So this was from a survey in the 2018-19 um, uh, season of, of around 500 um, farms. And so nationally, uh, around 46% of um, herds there were milked full season twice a day. So 20% of you got that one right. There was another 12% that were using three and two milking for at least part of the season. That could of course get, um, start three and two and then maybe use once a day later in lactation as well. We couldn't split that out. Uh, there was 34% that were using part season once a day. So that's that group that it could be from switching at Christmas, it could be later in lactation, that's sort of all been grouped together there. And then 8% of herds uh, being milked full season once a day. And if we look at that by island, um, the number of twice a day is reasonably similar and the number of once a day is reasonably similar, but there being a, a definite difference where um, more, there's 30% of herds in the South Island um, using three and two. Um, and so that's sort of replacing some of the part season once a day use in the North Island. And actually, if we go and look, look down at a, a more detailed regional level, um, if we take somewhere like Northland, where um, the average, again, digging back to those annual dairy stats, the average there is about, I think, 320, 330 kilos of milk solids, which says there's a lot of herds in that, those lower producing categories with little opportunity cost of going once a day, then there's a, a large uh, use of once a day in that area, similar for um, top of the south west coast there. Equally, if we look at Canterbury and North Otago, where um, there is probably a lot of herds in that higher producing category, we see that um, three and two is a, is a much more popular um, option. So why three and two? Just to sort of summarise that that part. So we know once a day milking is a suitable strategy for many farms. We've seen sort of 20 to 25, and then potentially even another 20% where it could could work. But it's going to be harder to justify for those high producing herds or farms with um, lesser ability to reduce costs. Um, so uh, let's say that there was a, for a, for a herd that um, a medium producing herd that there's like a 10% loss of production. Well, if you can offset enough costs to, um, to, to offset that lost revenue, then obviously you can maintain, or in some cases, maybe even improve profitability in situations where the, some of those costs are fixed, like for example, irrigation, that's not gonna change. 
um, when you go once a day. So uh, there's a there's a lesser ability to scale some of those costs. We know from some uh, old research that milk secretion is only up to around 16 to 18 hours. And we know that many farmers are using three and two in late lactation successfully, which kind of led to the question um, from a number of farmers that were using it in that late lactation period, can three and two play a greater role in our farm systems, i.e. using it from, let's say, uh, December or even full season potentially. And so that led to a three-year sustainable farming fund project, which is um, what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the presentation. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page with uh, what three and two is, I've um, essentially three and two, it's short for milking three times in two days. I've, I'm using it in the context of it covering all milking intervals between once a day and twice a day and results in around 25% fewer milkings than twice a day. But there are a lot of variations out there in, in terms of what people are doing, both in the timing of milkings and potentially the number as well. And so sometimes that 25 could be even slightly more than, than that. And in terms of, of those timings, we've got the blue box there as an example of a kind of a conventional twice a day system where you use 10 and 14 hour intervals. So the 10 hours referring to 5 a.m. through to 3 p.m. And then another 14 hours to get through to, to that 5 a.m. again. An example of three and two is, um, and I'm, I'm going to use this example throughout the presentation of 12, 18, 18. So 12 hours from 5 a.m. through to 5 p.m. and then another 18 hours through to 11 a.m. again. Now, as I said, there's a lot of variations out there. Originally, um, three and two kind of started as it's, uh, being called 16 hour milkings because it was 16, 16, 16. Um, but over time, that's kind of evolved to try and make those hours more attractive. And so it sort of moved to 14, 16, 18, and now 12, 18, 18 is the most common interval being used, which is why we've tested it out uh, in the experiment, which I'll get to in, in a bit. Um, but equally, there's actually farmers now that are pushing the boundaries of those intervals even further to 10, 19, 19, or in some cases, even like 8 to 20, 20, to, to try and um, shorten the day length of that of the, the day one period there. And so just to kind of elaborate on some of those options that there are out there, I've just put together a, a little selection. There's, as I said, there's lots of them out there and just talked about some of the potential pros and cons that um, people have mentioned to me from a people perspective. It's not necessarily a holistic kind of thing. So 10 and 14, that's our traditional um, milking interval. Even if you don't, want to change the number of milkings, um, there is still the ability to stay twice a day and change those intervals um, to, for example, eight and 16, where you can then um, either start later or finish earlier or a bit of both um, as being the, the main advantage for that. Um, and certainly larger farms, we see that being more common. Uh, one, one potential drawback that people mention is that uh, depending on how you structure your day, you can end up getting less done because um, there's a shorter period between those milkings. And another thing just to keep in mind with moving to those, those kind of uh, more uneven milking intervals, there is a larger volume of milk to harvest at that morning milking. So in this example, there'd be twice as much milk at the 16 hour, after 16 hours as there would be eight. Just means that we need to make sure that we've got um, the milking routine and some of those milk smart kind of messages really good to, to make sure that that morning milking doesn't end up dragging on too long. With three and two, um, with a 12, 18, 18 hour interval, um, it does open up the ability to use flexible staff. So for example, outsourcing and milking. So every second day, there's gonna be a milking at uh, 11 o'clock or whatever times you choose, but people take that 11 o'clock kind of time. Well, that's now occurring at a time where, um, let's say a stay-at-home parent, for example, who's only available between nine and three, well, previously they were um, difficult to employ on a farm, whereas now every second day there's a task that they, they could be em employed in. So um, potentially fewer uh, full-time staff and a greater use of flexible um, part-time staff potentially, certainly opening up a greater pool of people available to employ in the industry. One of the drawbacks is less consistency, um, both between days and between weeks. So 
um, between days, obviously it means on day one, um, you end up with you've got your 5 a.m. start, say, and then on day two, you've got your 11 a.m. start. Some people like that and, and that ability to sleep in. Um, other people don't like that. And I mean, I guess that, that, that's not surprising, different, different strokes for different folks, right? Um, but equally, if you do like that consistent routine, there's no reason why you still couldn't get up early to, to try and keep that routine going. The between weeks one, that's three and two, has a fortnightly uh, repeating pattern. So um, it does sometimes mean it's not, depending on the, you can't just look up a day of the week and know whether there's one or two milkings on that day, which um, for some people uh, adds an extra layer of complication to things. Obviously that ends up with 25% fewer milkings. Another one which I'll just mention is 10 and 7. Um, and so uh, that's basically a, the same as a three and two uh, pattern, which means Monday, Wednesday, Friday, are, uh, and, or a conventional three and two is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday are the twice a day days on the first week, and then Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday being the once a day, or the days with one milking. 10 and seven just means on that Sunday where there would have otherwise been two milkings, you only do one. And so the advantage of that is on both the weekend days, you only get one milking, which of course brings the other benefit then of consistent weeks. So you always know, depending on the day of the week, how many milkings there are. And that actually results in 29% fewer milkings than um, twice a day. And then of course, on the other side, we've got once a day, which being the, I guess that ultimate and flexibility in terms of being able to milk at any time during the day then and really uh, similar to three and two, I suppose, really increasing that pool of available people, but every day rather than perhaps every second day. Um, probably Callum, it's a good opportunity if there's been any questions so far to jump in and um, answer any of those before we get too much further. Um, there's one around, is, is it difficult for cows to adjust um, in going to mid-season three and two? Um, we don't have any experimental uh, sort of evidence to answer that yet. We, we have um, collected some data on it, but I haven't analysed it yet. But farmer experience um, would say that cows do, um, we all know cows are creatures of habit, um, but they can, they settle into that new routine um, reasonably quickly, sort of within that first week anyway, and, and there becomes a new normal. Uh, in many respects, cows are um, probably more adaptable than um, than people are to some extent. I've got a few <laughs> now. The questions are starting to come in here. Flooding it out, What percentage of the New Zealand herd is full season once a day, and what's the split between the North Island and South Island? Yep. So I think if we we pop back to that slide um, here, um, then uh, I don't know the num the difference in those numbers slightly, but so that the full season that was eight percent over the um, nationally a full season once a day, of which there is slightly more in the the North Island than the South Island, but perhaps not as big a difference as many would would expect. We got another one. Okay, yep. Um, what are the typical somatic cell count trends under three and two and um, ten and seven? Okay, can we park that one? Because um, I've we've got some data coming up that might help answer that. Okay, and another one might be a bit complicated, but how, how do you deal with AI during? Okay, yep, well, we might park that one too because I've got, got some slides on that. Okay. Perhaps uh, should we keep going maybe and, and see if some yeah, of these yeah. questions get answered along the way? I'll try to track. Okay, so then we've got another poll now. Um, so uh, what is your experience with using three and two milking? And this is um, where this is sort of covering off whether you've, have you ever used it? I've used it in the past, but not now, et cetera, et cetera. There's four different options we've got there. Like three quarters of you have voted so far. OK, 
Yeah, it's probably close enough. 86% of the vote in. So it looks like um, around half of the audience is already using three and two in their system. There's a, another 15% that have used it in the past. Um, other 14% that um, have thought about using it but haven't. And then around a quarter that haven't used three and two previously. So good, good split. Okay, let's keep going now. So, um, hopefully, leading into some some areas that will address some of those questions that we've got coming in. So, um, I'm just going to outline what we've got planned over that three year um, flexible milking ECFF Sustainable Farming Fund project. So, it started back in July. We'll run for three years. So this first year, the main activities we've got going is a farmlet experiment at the uh, Lincoln University Research Dairy Farm. And I'll cover off some more detail about that shortly. And then we've also been doing some farmer interviews of those that have been using it in their system already to capture some of those uh, kind of practical tips and tri tricks, uh, what questions they had while they were adopting it and what have they still got to try and help answer some of those questions that uh, you've got now that are coming in. And I'll uh, touch on those as well. So then uh, next year we'll we'll summarise the information that we picked up there into some initial resources and share that out with the, the wider group. Um, we've got around um, 400 people subscribed to the email newsletter, which you can go um, the links, the details there across the bottom of the screen there. Um, there's a fortnightly update going out from the farmland experiment at the moment. Um, so uh, share that out with the group and, and obviously a wider group to get some feedback on that. Um, we've also got some pilot farms, so working with about three uh, commercial dairy farms across the country um, to go through that journey of adopting three and two and, and working out how, how it works for their farm on a, that it's looking like probably on a full season three and two basis is what we're looking to try and do there. Um, and the other, uh, point of that is to try and capture some of the people metrics. So, you know, the farmland experiment will answer a lot of the questions around the, the physical uh, differences between the farm systems, but um, what does this mean for the people on the farm? I want to try and capture some of that. And then another experiment, really trying to address the question around um, how far can you push those milking intervals? So, like I said, it's kind of evolved from 16, 16, 16 to 12, 18, 18, and I guess the question people are asking is how far can I go or what's the trade-off if I go further than that? And so uh, with the, the new information from those second two parts plus any feedback that we've had on the resources will go into sort of a revised set of resources and another opportunity to do some modelling. And so that's where we can answer some of those more tricky questions um, that we couldn't necessarily answer with experiments. So for example, how would you combine all these different milking intervals together? So someone might want to, I want to milk once a day for the first two or three weeks of the season during a really busy calving period. Then maybe I want to uh, go twice a day for a bit and then go three and two from um, from December onwards and then maybe finish in late lactation. There's, there's obviously a whole lot of different combinations that you could uh, combine these together, which would be very difficult to run an experiment. So um, we can use modeling to try and give some information around those. And then, of course, trying to get those um, messages out there like we're doing at the moment. And so I'll just uh, elaborate on those first two parts now. So the experiment, the farmland experiment that we've got set up at the Lincoln University Research Dairy Farm, um, we've got four herds running there. We've got a full season uh, three and two herd. We've got a, a, a herd that started twice a day and then switched um, to three and two from 1st of December. We've got a uh, herd that started twice a day and has now switched this month over to three and two. And then we've got a um, a full season twice a day herd as kind of our control. Or what we might see is even many people are familiar with that kind of first of March kind of timeline. So there's two, two kind of um, comparisons that people can make uh, to how they may be using it at the moment. Which leads nicely into our last poll question. Um, so for those, sorry for the, the quarter of you that haven't used three and two, uh, or slightly more than that actually, um, but for those of you that have used it or have used it in the past, um, when in the season have you been using three and two milking? Okay. 
you've got options of all season, early lactation, mid lactation and late lactation. Okay, we've got 50% voted. I'll probably close it off there because not everyone's going to vote on this one. So the results, so around 4% using it for the full season, 6% in early lactation, and then around half from mid lactation, then around 40% from that late lactation period, which sort of stacks up with um, a lot of the data that we see coming in and how people are using it at the moment. Great, so um, just a bit more information about the, the, the background of the farmlet. So we've got, if for those that are being, or when they're being milked twice a day, we're using that conventional 10 and 14 hour interval. Um, for three and two, we're using that 12, 18, 18 hour interval because that was the most common one people were using. We're stocked at three and a half cows a hectare. And just a note there that we do have 29% heifers. We're really using all of the cows on the farm. or So we will, we, we, had to use all the cows on the farm so we couldn't be picky necessarily about um, which animals we got so I guess just to keep that in mind with um, some of the numbers you see. We've got 11 paddocks per farmlet and so that means since balance date we've been grazing the herds have been in each paddock for two days and they get a new break a fresh break after each milking which means um, over that two day period the three and two herd gets three breaks and the twice a day herd gets four breaks and that puts us on a um, 22 day round for most of the year. Each of the farmlets has the same set of management decision rules. Well, sorry, there's one set of management decision rules that that uh, is being used across uh, right across the farmlets. But depending on what the physical results are from each of those farmlets, they are being managed independently. So we don't have to um, make exactly the same decision across all of them. Having said that, um, so far, because they are all the same stocking rate, they've all behaved very similarly in a grazing management sense. So this was up to uh, about a month ago when I pulled these numbers together. So they'd all received about the same amount of nitrogen. They'd all grown about the same amount of pasture. There are some small differences there, but I think, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't expect to see them necessarily there at the end of the year. I think that's within the realms of experimental measurement. Um, there are a few differences there in terms of the silage fed and made, um, but when you put the two together, um, the, the net amount of um, supplement being used across the farmlets has been reasonably um, similar. So onto the production results, which is um, what, what everyone wants to kind of know about. Um, so these are just some primary results. Obviously the, the experiment's still running, um, but just summarizing, uh, in a, in a uh, brief way, the, the spring results. So that's from calving through to the end of November. And so I remember at that time, there was one herd being milked three and two and three being milked twice a day. So there was a 10% difference in the milk yield between those two groups. The three and two herd did have a, a higher uh, milk solids percentage. So that helped offset some of that difference. So there was a 4% difference in milk solids production as an average across that whole four month period. Uh, in terms of cell count there, there was a, a, a difference as well. Now there has been a difference with uh, um, three and two herd having a slightly higher cell count. And if we go back to that, that once a day uh, study I, I mentioned earlier at the start of the, the presentation with the 300 farms, for those herds that had gone once a day, the average increase in cell count for them was 27,000. Um, so, I guess this number here is, is probably not that surprising, sitting somewhere in, in half of that once a day kind of category. Um, but certainly, um, yeah, num numbers that are um, not very high in terms of the that cell count. Uh, in terms of the summer period, so that's that from 1st of December through till about that 20th of February when I pull these numbers together. So now I remember at that period, we've got two herds being milked, three and two, and, and two being milked twice a day. So the numbers in a percentage sense were actually reasonably consistent. So again, that 10% difference in milk um, yield and that 4% difference in um, milk solids production. So the, those two herds were performing reasonably similarly across that period as well. Now, 
Uh, we had one really good question at the farmers form around the actual ratio of fat and protein. Um, and so the, there is a bit of a difference there. So if you take that into, uh, into account using today's um, milk price, where um, fat is, is worth more than protein, um, then the three and two herd actually has a five cent higher milk price, um, which means that 4% difference in milk solids production becomes a 3% difference in um, revenue that, that you'd be receiving. Which leads us actually on to, it wasn't our last poll or last one, but we've got one more. Um, so looking at these results, that three or 4% kind of number, um, how do you think that would stack up for your farm? Does that sort of look like, yeah, I could make that work or um, no, that's that's too much for me? Interesting to get your, your feedback on that. Okay, we've got 60% voted so far. Okay, 75%. Okay, we might close it off there, shall we? So looks like um, the majority of you said I could maintain profit with some minor tweaks to offset that change. 13% uh, saying I'd have to make some major changes to my um, the way I run my farm to make that work. 8% saying um, that's too much, that wouldn't work for me. And 16% saying that I'd be happy to trade that off for improvement in lifestyle. Interesting. Okay, so um, the final kind of section uh, is just summarising some of the um, information that's come out of those farm interviews, which perhaps will address some of those practical questions that uh, we got had coming in earlier. So um, I guess, what, well, first of all, what were we trying to achieve with those farmer interviews? The first part was understanding the decision-making process that people had gone through to that led them to adopting uh, three and two. And understanding what key questions that they had going through that process and still had to help guide that, that resource development for us. We did, um, I think we actually did 13 interviews in the end. Um, and tr across those interviews tried to cover a range of different uses and circumstances. So um, using it part season, full season, some using really different, pushing the boundaries out with those milking intervals in terms of the hours. Uh, big farm, small farm, owner, operator, share milker, trying to see, cover cover a range of those different systems. And so it's just to briefly touch on some of the messages that came through there. Um, the One of the key things that came through was do it before you need it, which I think probably relates through to the second point that people made that it's not necessarily a tool to reduce feed intake, which when you look at those production results that we saw earlier, I guess it's not surprising. If the cows are producing as much, then they're probably going to be eating a reasonably similar uh, amount of feed. Uh, the other thing was that there's no right or wrong way. There were a whole range of different um, ways that in practice people had gone about applying or setting up three and two on their farm. Uh, really understanding the why. So what's the goal that you're trying to achieve with this? And then making sure that whatever changes you make lead to achieving that goal because just changing milking frequency and nothing else may not actually let you achieve that that goal and then uh, the other part uh, the other message which was very resounding from all of them was around just do it um, you know we can provide the, the experiments and things like that will help give some confidence to farmers around what you might expect from going three and two um, but there's always going to be some differences between farms and and um, yeah, I guess there's always going to be a level of uncertainty, uh, and so just having that confidence to to just do it um, was was the resounding message from from that group. Some some practical tips. Um, three of them I'm going to go through. One of them was around tanker scheduling. So uh, if you were on skipper day pickup, then there was little difference between three and two and twice a day because obviously um, three and two has that 48 hour cycle. 
Uh, the only uh, difference was if that skipper day was scheduled during the morning or um, sort of early, uh, late, after, late morning, then obviously every second day, if it's on the day with the 11 a.m. milking, you could end up with a clash there. So um, I guess something to keep in mind. But for those that are on a daily pickup, and now I've assumed for the ease of trying to simplify this diagram down that um, the pickup would occur at the same time every day. Um, then we did identify one window there where it would be good to avoid having the tanker coming. I've just used uh, to gain that same uh, 12, 18, 18 hour interval, so 5 a.m., 5 p.m., 11 a.m. And so if the tanker came between the seven and the sort of seven, nine o'clock kind of window here, then on day one, it would be picking up the 18 hour interval and another 18 hour interval. So if the reason you're on daily pickup is because of that capacity, then you could be at risk of flooding the vat there because you've got 36 hours of worth of milk. On day two, then you've only got the 12 hour milking. Now, that could be more of a, an issue at this time of the year when we head into later lactation where the cell count from that, that shorter interval milking is a little bit higher. So one of the farms we talked to uh, was actually getting quite uh, close to um, grading when the tanker picked up that just that day two milk with nothing else in the vat. Um, for the other interval, the other windows, sorry, uh, Again, they're all reasonably similar. It depends on day one or day two, which has the most milk, but both of them have an 18 hour interval and a 12 and an 18 hour interval in that as part of that pickup. So just something to keep in mind. The other one is around mating, which of course, we've already had a question come in around that. Um, of the farmers that we interviewed as part of this, there were a variety of options. Um, and again, probably fits into that. There's no one right way of doing it. Some of them were mating after every milking. That was ones that either had a very flexible technician that lived nearby or were doing the mating themselves. There was another group out there that were mating at the same time each day, i.e. just like they were with twice a day. So and that could have occurred at each of the three milk, each of those three milkings. But if we just take the AM, for example, so that would mean on day one, then you would mate after that morning milking as per you normally would have. Then in preparation for day two, at the PM milking, you would then draft out animals to mate for that next morning milking and you would just bring them in, uh, the technician would serve them and then they would join the herd at, milk, back at milking time at that 11 o'clock. That does mean that there would needed to be a separate mob um, running uh, to have that, which could be an inconvenience for some people. And then finally, there were also then a group um, that on day one, they were just mating after the morning milking. And then on day two, they were mating after that 11 a.m. milking. And so the, obviously the big advantage with that one being um, that uh, you don't need to have that separate mob, um, but equally you probably need to be able to work in with that technician where on day one, you can be early in the run and then on day two, you can be later in the run. Um, it does mean that there's more than a 24 hour gap uh, between the day one and day two, but um, the, the farmers that we were talking to using that system were still getting excellent reproductive results. So um, perhaps doesn't need to be, I, I think based on all those different options, mating doesn't have to be a barrier to using three and two milking for the, for the whole season. And then finally, um, just some practical tips around grazing. So one of the most frequently asked questions is around, well, if I'm using those uneven intervals like that 12, 18, 18, do I offer uh, areas that are proportional to those hours or do I equal, a, do I offer um, them equal allocation across the herd? Again, that was one that seemed to fit into that there was no one right way or wrong way to do it. Um, some people were, were offering it proportionally to the hours. I think one message that came through there with that was that it's um, very easy to overcomplicate things. And when you're relying on different people on different days to do that allocation, they, that did increase the risk of mistakes being made. Um, so there had been another group then that had sort of gone from that to then just offering equal areas after each milking and that, sort of using the theory that um, while that 12 hour period is shorter, it does happen during the day. So um, and cows being active grazers during that day, so a, a greater ability to to um, to eat eat the feed available to, on offer to them. Then 
obviously from uh, the results we've seen tonight, many it's most common to use three and two in that mid lactation period, which coincides often when when people are looking to extend that grazing rotation. So that would be, you know, if you're feeding a paddock after each milking, that would be going from feeding four paddocks every two days to three paddocks every two days. And so that would be, you know, going from like a 20 to 27 day round or something like that. Um, I guess just a word of caution there around checking the allocation. There had been a few occasions where people had not redone the numbers. And if, if um, the pre-grazing cover is still the same, when you make that switch, then you're going to be offering less feed. So making sure that that switch is timed when uh, you're in a period of surplus so that the pre-grazing covers are actually higher or um, feeding some supplement to top them up during that period until the pre-grazing covers get into the, the right um, alignment with, with what your feed demand is. And then um, for those that are, uh, that are thinking about going three and two for the full season, um, really just sitting down and, and working out for your individual farm with the number of paddocks you've got, the variation in paddock sizes, which you may or may not have, how you would apply different rotation lengths at different times of the year, because um, it will potentially look a bit different to the system you've always used previously on the, um, twice a day. So just to wrap up before we go to some questions, um, circling back to that original question around can we adapt milking intervals to improve workplace attractiveness? Um, I think uh, we've ticked the first one there. There are lots of different options available there. Even if you want to stay twice a day, there's still options around making those milk milking intervals work for you. Uh, we know three and two has been uh, commonly used in, in mid to late lactation already. The farm results are looking really encouraging, I think, for uh, for a lot of people, 63% of you were saying that could work for me, um, or actually more. Uh, and then if that decision is to do that, uh, then really understanding the why, what am I trying to achieve with this to make sure that we achieve that goal, and then making some good plans in advance. And that's like what I just mentioned with that grazing, grazing management and a whole host of other things around organising the rosters and, and um, staff management sort of side of things. So that's it from the formal presentation, but let's try and take off some more of these questions. How many have we got now, Callum? Um, we've got about 25, so. Right. <laughs> so we might not be able to get through all of them, but if we try and take off some of the common ones, if there's themes there. Um, um, one is from Ireland. Um, is there a big individual cow variation with three and two like you see with once a day? Good question. Um, so I, ha I haven't had the time so far to go through and look through the farm results so far to see um, if that's the case. I would expect, you know, we know that is the case with once a day, like you mentioned. Um, I would expect that three and two would be, there may be elements of that. You know, if we think three and two sort of sitting somewhere between once a day and twice a day, probably closer to the twice a day one, there will be elements of that. There's probably going to be a, a couple of cows that don't suit that system, but Perhaps, well, I would expect it being not as bad as once a day. Um, what, what time do people generally milk with 10 and 7? Right, so that's a good question. I don't. Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, so that's that sort of three and two with the once a day weekend approach. So I don't actually have a good answer for that at this point. Um, and that's. Um, yeah, I, I guess the, the the hopefully will be addressed through the that intervals experiment, that next one, as to what any trade-offs uh, might be going on in there. Um, yeah. So um, but but if we but what sorry just to follow up with that one more piece of info. Um, so uh, what we do see on that Sunday is that people try generally try and choose the milking time to be in the middle of that interval between what it was on Saturday and what it will be on the Monday morning. So um, let's say uh, that um, if the Saturday one was 11 o'clock, just like because it fitted into that same routine, then the Sunday one might be more like at 7 o'clock to try and even out that, that interval, if that makes sense. Uh, Paul, is there, is there any data comparing traditional three and two and um, the 20 hour, eight hour split. Yeah, um, 
So no, uh, not that I've got to hand, um, and I, I'm certainly not aware of any experiments that have tested that. Um, there are a few farmers I've heard of giving that a go, um, which it, from, from what I've heard sounds like it's gone uh, well for them, but that's really where that uh, next season's experiment will come in to try and uh, help help answer that. Um, any any um, reflections on why did people stop using three and two? People that stopped. Uh, sorry, so that I didn't quite catch that. What was um, of the people that have stopped using three and two? Why? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, again, I probably don't have a great answer for that. Um, other than I think um, from my observation would be that there is an element of love it or hate it when it comes to three and two and it does seem to be quite strong personal preferences that come through there um, so um, you know when you, there is changes in key farm staff on the farm then um, you know sometimes one manager or, or there's a farm team that really kind of want it and then maybe some of them move on and then the next year I oh, actually you know we, we want to go twice a day or um, for because they were like the consistency of the routine or something like that so that would be my guess as to the reason, but um, there could be others too. It could be climatic, um, that some people have used it in, in seasons because of, of tough seasons and uh, next year when it, the season was better, they've, they've stayed with their previous system. Can we have a, uh, just a few questions about the trial too? So um, one question is, uh, is there any age group bias within the four herds? Uh, each, for example, older cows going all season um, or taking it easy with three and two straight away? Any yeah. difference? Um, so in terms of the herds themselves, they were all randomly allocated prior to the start of the season. Um, so they are balanced for, for age structure, um, if, if that kind of answers that question largely. Um, and any difference between um, uh, breeds and adaptation to three and two Jersey versus others? Yeah, look, it's a really good question. One that I don't have a great uh, answer for at this point. In terms of the herds themselves, I wouldn't behaviourally, I wouldn't necessarily expect there to be a lot of difference. Um, but we know, for example, under once a day that um, Jersey cows seem to be more tolerant, although there are a number of Frisian once a day herds as well. Um, so perhaps there is a Jersey's may be more suited to three and two, but um, yeah, we don't have any experimental evidence to, to to back that that statement up. And certainly in the farmlets, the cows are um, a very standard sort of South Island crossbred, so um, F12, J4 kind of kind of breed. It's good you just answered one of the other questions um, about um, which, which breed is in the trial. Um, and I don't know if we actually covered this, but uh, body condition score and lameness are being tracked in the trials. Yep, so we are tracking those things. Um, so far, the three and two herd has had a higher average condition by about 0.1 or 0.2 units on average. Um, I guess it's going to be interesting to see as we go through whether that difference is maintained because uh, you know averages can hide many things. So what does that distribution look like? And we have just last week um, made our first kind of cull of, of animals as we head into autumn. And in the three and two herd, there were two cows in particular that um, have been very much passengers. So they're producing uh, quite a bit less than their herd mates and were in a very good nick. So sort of five and a half kind of condition. Um, so they'll have been helped bump the average body condition up. So, um, so once we take those away, uh, there might be less difference between the herds, um, which again, if they're producing a, a similar amount, then perhaps we wouldn't expect as big differences there. However, um, the, what, the only other experiment that, we've, that, I, that I've ever found anyway, uh, that's been, was done in New Zealand in 1985 in the Rukura's Farmer Conference there. Um, they used some twins um, and uh, they, the cow's milk three and two there uh, produced 6% less milk fat. So they were, at that stage, they were only getting paid for fat. 
and but they did dry off in 0 0.7 condition score greater. So um, there is certainly some evidence there to suggest that the three and two herd maybe end up in better body condition. Okay, um, there's a few questions coming at the end around um, the repro results. Mm -hmm. uh, um, have you got any further um, comment around why why you've got those results? Yeah, so um, just sorry, to finish answering that other question around the lameness, we're obviously tracking that as well. Um, the reproduction results, as well as the lameness, I guess we just have to keep in mind the farmlet is set up to try and test differences in milk production. Um, when it comes to things like reproduction, where you've kind of got quite binary traits like pregnant, empty, or um, pregnant at six weeks or not, that kind of thing, you actually really need large, large numbers of cows, like thousands of cows to pick up statistically different results there. Um, and so I certainly wouldn't be reading too much into the reproductive results that, that we've got, which for those that hadn't seen them, um, uh, weren't great. Um, the average non calf rate across the whole farm was 23%, uh, I think, um, which is in line with what the farm had been doing previously. Um, but it does mean that when you get into these uh, smaller herds, um, numbers can jump around a little bit. So I think off the top of my head, the three and two herd had a 21% um, not in calf rate. Um, the December herd actually had a even higher, I think it was around 30. And then the three and two, uh, the twice a day herds, or well, the herds that were twice a day at that point, actually had slightly better reproductive results, um, including the one that had the, the, the one that actually had the best results was the slowest calving, the poorest submission, uh, sort of had everything going against it, which is obviously makes it quite difficult to explain why we've got those results, um, other than to say because of the small number of animals. Um, I probably wouldn't read too much into it when you when you talk to farmers that have been using it before mating or prior to mating. Um, it seems like they've been really happy at the reproductive results they get. So, sorry, it doesn't really answer it all that well, but it's probably the best I've got at this point. Yeah, so I think it, um, there was another question about in the interview did any of the farmers have comments on repro. So yeah, so all of them were very happy with their repro results uh, for those that had been using it um, through that mating or bef before that mating period. And so um, people achieving the industry targets of the 78% six week and calf rate. Which, for, by the way, for the farmlets, I think they, the three of them were about that 55%. So they, the, while there might have been differences not in calf rate, um, the, the six week calving rate was reasonably similar for them, except that one herd I mentioned that did amazingly well, uh, given all everything was stacked against them. Okay, um, um, someone who's currently using three and two on a low production herd, next season um, they're milking a high production herd. Um, what would be the impact of three and two? Um, and I think the question is, that would it would be better to go three and two in March. Yeah. Um, it depends a bit on what we're talking about there in terms of high producing or low producing. Um, I guess the, the numbers that I presented here, and it was one of the questions that was asked at the Farmers Forum was um, for the production numbers that I presented, what, what is the numbers that you're likely to end up with at a season to date basis? Um, we were on track for doing around that 480 um, milk solids a cow for the twice a day group with obviously the three and two then being 4% less than that at around, well the full season one then that would end up at around that 460 uh, milk solids a cow. Um, we've had a really tough autumn like I guess a lot of the country. Um, we've got quite a hole in our um, feed budget so um, I'm thinking we're probably going to not, we're going to have to dry a few cows off a bit earlier than we had planned so we may not quite get to that level of production. But if that kind of helps those numbers, I suppose, if that 470, 480 is, is where that person was talking about, uh, then that 4% loss might be what you'd expect to see. Um, yeah. I'm conscious it's eight o'clock, but I've got a lot more questions if you want to 
go for another five minutes or something. Yep, yep, we can go for a bit longer. People can log off if they need to go. Um, um, what happens to somatic cell count in a commercial herd? Um, well, in, in a herd, I guess, that has more the, the New Zealand average cell count. Yeah. You know, not, not all herds have such low cell count. Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. Again, I possibly should have gone and done some more digging uh, on that before this webinar because I don't have any numbers on my fingertips there. Um, but that's certainly something that we can look to pull out and put into those um, those resources. And I can try and get back to that person with what the answer to that question might might be. Um, certainly, you know, it's like I've mentioned before. If if there's any for that herd that that person's thinking about. If they know what may have been under once a day, um, then you would expect three and two to be a bit less than that in terms of what the, the increase may have been. Uh, just to sw switch gears a little bit, any any proven environmental benefits from um, different milking? Mm, good question. Um, uh, short answer is possibly. Um, I guess on the milking platform side of things, I wouldn't expect there, I guess based on the, the results we're getting so far, I wouldn't expect there to be large differences on the milking platform side of things. But if we are drying off and better, well, if there is better body condition score um, and that leads to better reproductive performance and drying off and better body condition score, then that could have two, two impacts on a support block side of things um, or runoff. Uh, or if you're wintering on, then potentially having some impact on the milking platform, um, where if they're drying off in better condition, potentially that means that they need to put on less over that winter period, therefore less um, crop winter crop area being required or um, less cover maybe being required if you're wintering on. Um, so that certainly from a South Island perspective, that winter crop aspect may be uh, less area being required. Um, obviously then people would need to look at how they've got their grazing contracts set up. So if you're paying on a per week basis, you may not actually be able to capture the benefit of um, being in better condition. Uh, whereas if you're paying on a, like a dry matter basis, then um, you can say, well, look, this is the amount of feed I'm buying over that, that period. And then the other area could have a benefit is around if there is better reproductive performance, then needing fewer replacement animals um, to carry. Uh, so that could have both uh, greenhouse gas and nitrogen leaching implications potentially. Okay, um, this might be a bit of a hard one with the trial, but what what was the decrease in expenses for the trial? Do you have any um, data on that? Yeah, not really. Um, and certainly that's the plan is to use the farm physical results to do some economic modelling. Um, I don't think the farmlets themselves are a great uh, way of, uh, they're not going to necessarily provide great guidance on what differences in cost there were, because keep in mind, because we've got all of those different milking intervals on the one farm, the poor old farm team actually every second day, they've got three milkings. Um, so we're not necessarily going to pick up great data from that. Um, what we will be able to do is say, well, this is the differences in physicals using some regional averages um, this is what uh, changes you might uh, be reasonably likely to expect uh, in terms of maybe how much you'd need to offset or not. Um, but that's really where the, those commercial pilot farms come in and, and um, seeing where some of those differences come through for them. Okay, maybe, um, maybe some last ones. Um, did you get any feedback in the interviews um, from employees about um, what they thought about. Yeah, um, a little bit, but that's again probably something we need to do a little bit more work on. Um, and and again, working with those commercial pilot farms, I think it's a good opportunity to do that. Um, and and we're also planning a group of associate farms around them to, to that that uh, that are trying out different things with three and two. So there may be some opportunities to survey some of them too. Um, but uh, the one one that just stuck in my mind that sort of is related to that was um, where again a bit like that love it or hate it kind of thing where um, uh, a, far, a farm owner decided we're going to go three and two uh, and the farm 
uh, the staff member they had working for them on farm um, sort of like complained about that and didn't like that irregular routine and, and the changes of hours, things like that. Um, but then when the farm owner put it back to them, um, do they want to go back to twice a day? That was a very resounding no. <laughs> I would rather stay three and two. So um, I guess, uh, yeah, um, there's probably going to be some differences between people there. Yeah, but I think in general, it seems like the, the staff enjoy it too. Um, I'll, I'll slide one more and um, are there production triggers about when to go to three and two during the season? Yep, so that's another good question. Um, so certainly around the, the sort of Canterbury area, there's um, this magic number of 1.62 I keep hearing about. Um, I'm not sure um, necessarily some of the detail, it sounds like a very exact number and, and whether that's actually uh, the right number or not. I think um, we've debated whether we should use production triggers uh, in the farmlets as to when we switched from twice a day to three and two for those two, two farmlets that switch. Um, in the end, we decided to use a date trigger um, because it, again, the, the main purpose of this project being around the people and trying to improve that, that, that side of reducing work hours, increasing flexibility. Um, the challenge with a production trigger is you never know exactly when you're gonna hit that trigger. So planning annual leave for someone or some days off, et cetera. Um, if you're waiting for that production trigger, it, it makes that quite hard. Whereas if you've got a date trigger, you know, okay, I can plan right from the start of the year. I know this is when I'm gonna switch. This is when I can plan a holiday, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now the date triggers do roughly line up with that December herd that switched uh, when the cows were doing about two milk solids and the December one switched when they were doing, I think about 1.7, something like that. Um, and it seemed like that one that switched in March um, did largely hold, I think it was about a 0.05 um, decrease, but equally there was in that the twice a day group as well, i.e. they were all starting to, to go down. Um, so I would suggest, again, given that the three and two cows, what they, you know, they peaked over two milk solids a cow, I would think that the production trigger is likely much higher than that 1.6 kilos that, that I keep hearing. Um, what the actual number is, uh, not sure if there is even a magic number, um, but we maybe get some more answers to that from next year's experiment where we can look through different, um, uh, when, we, when we change those different intervals, um, we can look at different groups of cows that are at their different production levels and see what impact that it had on them. So we we might be able to try and get some more information around that. Okay. I promise this is the last one. <laughs> they just keep coming. Um, is it? Do you think it's only applicable to a spring calving herd? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, off the top of my head, there's no flags being raised as to why you couldn't do it from an autumn calving herd, or um, I guess maybe that question's coming at it from the angle of a split calving herd where you've got uh, animals at different stages of lactation. Um, I guess that might bring an extra level of complication, but um, um, again, what we're, if, if what we've seen so far continues through autumn, you know, there was that 4% difference in peak and the 4% difference through summer, or through spring and summer, sorry, to me says that maybe the timing around this doesn't actually matter as much as we first thought. Um, and it's it's all just kind of a percentage-based thing, in which case perhaps, um, uh, yeah, the, 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 whether you're split or autumn doesn't, doesn't make a huge difference. Um, 